to FWC Online. We are so glad to have you with us today, and we are very much looking forward to exploring God's Word together, and I hope that you are too. We would love to know that you're with us today, so if you do us a favor and let us know down in the comment section how you're doing today, something that went really well this week, or maybe even something you're looking forward to next week. And if today is your very first time with us, we would love to connect with you after today. All you have to do to help us make that happen is text the keyword CONNECT to 816-800-9937. You'll receive a reply message with a link to our digital connection card. Just tap on that link, complete that connection card, and we'll be in touch. And once again, thank you so much for being with us today. We really look forward to getting to know you better. In just a moment, we're going to be worshiping together in song. But before we do that, worship is so much more than just singing. It's a lifestyle, Scripture says, and it includes every area of our lives. Giving and how we use our finances is one of the most significant ways that we worship because our giving reveals where our heart is at and our heart is what God wants more than anything else. So as you consider your gift today, we want to first say thank you so much for your generosity and for being obedient to the Lord in giving your tithes and offerings. As a giver-supported church, we do not take your giving for granted. It is a blessing when we say thank you. For your convenience, you can give online through our website, fwcsmithville.com. You can give through the FWC app by tapping the Give link or even via mail. The simplest way, however, is to simply text the keyword GIVE to 816-800-9937 and you'll receive a reply message with a link to our secure online giving platform. Again, we want you to know your investment in God's kingdom makes a significant difference and we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And now we invite you to join us in a song of worship today. No. 
Welcome to church today, and we want to say a humongous thank you to every single person who helped with VBS last week. You are the best. Yes, and that is why we are in front of the set from VBS. We want to say a great big thank you to everyone to, who helped, everyone from decorating to those who helped plan it, and obviously those who helped us pull it off. There is no way it could have been done without every single one of you, and there is no telling how this week of VBS has impacted the lives of the 30 plus kids who were with us this week. So thank you so much for your investment in kids. We do want to remind you that today is the final community drop-off day for our clothing drive. And we want to say thanks to everybody who has helped us fill the family room with all kinds of bags. Now, if you forgot to bring your bags or clean out your closets, we have a secret. You have one more Sunday where you can drop off the donated items. One, he means one, the man is not lying. One, because next Sunday is the absolute final day for us to accept your donations for the clothing drive. So please make sure you bring any and all remaining donations to the church on or before next Sunday so that we can wrap up and conclude our clothing drive. He's insinuating that I lie often, so better listen to him. That may be the end of the clothing collections, but that will not conclude ways that you can help us with this, because on Tuesday, July 26th, we have to load all the donated items onto a U-Haul to deliver them to Savers, and we need your help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the part of the job I'm not looking forward to. And he's not lying. With so many bags to load, it would take us a long, long time to do it ourselves, but many hands make light the work. Savers is going to help us take care of unloading it, so all you have to do is be here at the church by 9 a.m. on Tuesday, July 26th, and give us a few minutes of your time to help us load those bags on the truck. With a good crew, it really should only take us about 30 minutes to knock it out. And now he's lying. Next Sunday begins an exciting and perhaps one of the most popular message series. The God on Films is back and better than ever. Yes, it is. If you don't know what God on Film is, let me tell you about it. It is when we take a theme, a thought, or an idea from a recent movie, and then we approach God's Word to see what it has to teach us about that particular theme or idea. 
You're lying, right? No, I'm not lying. That's awesome. When you come next Sunday, you will have fresh pop popcorn ready for you to grab and, and enjoy some uh, to enjoy for free. There will be a fun movie themed photo booth and you'll get some movie ticket giveaways. So invite a friend and join us the next four weeks for God on Film. It's going to be great. As a reminder, in less than a month, the very first payment deadline for the El Salvador missions trip will be due. Sunday, August the 14th is the due date and $300 is the payment amount. Also do us a favor and head, turn in your intent to participate form when you turn in your payment. And if you have any questions about that trip or you want some more information, just come talk to Pastor Jeremy or myself and we will hook you up with the details. All the details in these and all other FWC announcements and news items are located on the FWC app, which can easily be texted by, te by texting the keyword app to 816-800-9937 if I'm not lying. No, he's not lying. Those are this week's announcements, and now let's get into the Word of God together. Good morning and welcome back to the final message in the very first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Uh, last week we left off with Paul smack dab in mid-prayer for the Ephesian believers and then also for us. And uh, he was praying that God would give spiritual wisdom and insight so that we might grow in our knowledge of God. And we talked about how this knowledge is much more than just mere facts about Jesus. Yeah, it includes that type of knowledge, but it goes on to encompass an experiential knowledge of Jesus that really can only come through a personal encounter with Him. That full knowledge of God is what is most important for you and I to have. But Paul's prayer wasn't over. Now, we briefly made mention of the final request that Paul made for us, and today... We're going to dive deeper into that. His request was that we might understand the incredible greatness of God's power. All right, so Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 19. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. Now, being a pastor, uh, I use words a lot, so I occasionally get caught up in trying to grasp where a word comes from and how it came to mean what it does. Etymology is a field that studies this, and I struggle to imagine a career that could be more dull. <laughs> anyway, I recently got caught by the word understand. Now, we know it means to perceive the meaning of or to grasp the idea of something, right? But it's a lot more than that. Literally, it means to stand in the midst of. You gain a whole new understanding of, say, the power of a tornado when you stand in the midst of the destruction that one has caused versus just seeing it on television or online. Paul wants you and I to stand in the midst of the incredible greatness of God's power. When you stand in the midst of God's power, you understand the incredible greatness of God's plan. And Paul wants us to see for ourselves through data and through experience just how incredibly powerful our God really is. Now, when Paul wrote this originally, he crammed four synonyms for power into a single sentence, all in an effort to help us stand in the midst of. Okay, each synonym has a slightly different focus. So, dunamis is one of the symptoms. Uh, it's tra often translated power. It means capability or potential. The next one is energeia, right? Or working. It means effective or active power. The third one is kratos or mighty, or it means a, a force that um, overcomes resistance. And then the last one that Paul uses is the word iskus, 
or or strength. It refers to inherent vital power in God. Okay, so what is what does this mean? So let me give you an example of how this plays out. A bulldozer is a powerful dunamis machine. It's a powerful machine. It's got the ability, the capacity, and the potential strength to topple trees and to move massive amounts of earth. Okay. Now, you can stand next to a bulldozer, and just by standing next to it, you can sense its inherent strength, its iskus, even when this machine isn't running. But turn the key on, hear that engine roar, and experience this massive piece of machinery begin to move, and its force of power, its kratas, becomes clear and active, energia, as it as this dozer demonstrates its ability to topple trees and move earth. Okay, so that's what those words kind of mean. They're all synonyms of this idea of power. Now, the variety in these words underscores the completeness of God's power. Paul wants us to grasp not only the immensity of the power of God, but also the completeness of His power. And I want to try to help us stand in the midst of God's incredible power for just a moment today. We can see a small degree of the incredible greatness of God's power when we turn our telescopes to the sky. I've got a picture of our sun that I want to put up on the screen right now. It's a beautiful, terrifying um, planet, or not planet, star. Our sun, for example, is one of the ways that we can see God's and stand in the midst of God's incredible power. It's 864,000 miles in diameter. It consists of 335 quadrillion cubic miles of violently hot gases, and it weighs more than two octillion tons. My guess is you probably didn't even know that word octillion is a real word. And as impressive as those numbers and statistics are about our sun... Our sun is only a G-type main sequence star. There are four other star types bigger and brighter than our sun. Our sun shines 100,000 times less bright than its brightest neighbor, Sirius. And it orbits the center of our galaxy one time every 200 million years. Ladies and gentlemen, our sun, as massive as it is is a runt in comparison to many of the stars in our galaxy. The next picture I want to show you is a picture of what you can see with the naked eye. We can only see about 5,000 stars at night, right? The next picture is the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way so we can only see about 5,000 stars at night, even in the best conditions. Only about 5,000 stars can we see with the naked eye. The Milky Way, however, our galaxy contains anywhere from 100 billion stars on the low end to anywhere up to 400 billion stars on the high end. We can only see 5,000 of them. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. I've got a, a, an artist rendering of what we think that our galaxy looks like. We can't tell because we can't get far enough out. We can't get outside of it at all right now. We can't get far enough outside to even understand what it looks like. We can guess based upon what other galaxies look like. That is 100,000 light years in diameter. From one end to another, traveling at the speed of light would take you 100,000 years to go from one end to the other on just our galaxy. That's an inconceivable 600 million billion miles of stars just in our galaxy. The astronomer Edwin Hubble, for whom the Hubble Space Telescope was named, calculated that there are as many galaxies outside the Milky Way as there are stars in it. This is a picture that the Hubble Space Telescope took. Almost all of those pinpoints of light in that picture are other galaxies. And since our, those, all of those galaxies are moving further and further away from Earth, 
That means the entire visible universe is expanding in every conceivable direction. The, the distance between the Milky Way galaxy and the Hydra galaxy cluster, which is on the screen right now, that, that galaxy cluster has 157 galaxies packed so tightly together. That galaxy cluster is 175 million light years away from Earth. And it is increasingly moving away from us at a speed of 38,000 miles per second. In other words, this galaxy cluster is moving at one-fifth the speed of light. And God spoke it all into being when He said, let there be light. That is the exceeding greatness of God's power in the macro universe, the big universe. But we also see a degree of God's incredible power in the micro universe. Atoms are less than one millionth the thickness of a human hair. In the nucleus of an atom, the center of it, there are numerous protons and neutrons are packed together in an inconceivably small space. Each proton and neutron consists of three even smaller particles called quarks. So if a hydrogen atom were four miles in diameter, which, just to show you what this would look like, I've got another picture up on the screen. So it'd be from the Methodist Church north of our church, all the way south past Amory Road. Okay, that would be four miles in diameter. That would represent the entire uh, hydrogen atom. The nucleus of that atom would only be the size of a tennis ball. The remainder of that atom is mostly empty space where the electrons travel around. But, but the crazy thing is that those electrons make billions of tree, trips each millionth of a second. Like this is, if your mind isn't being blown, then you're not paying attention. The incredible speed of those electrons make the atom behave as though it were a solid, even though despite the fact that most of the atom is empty space. See, facts like that make most of our brains just real. But that is the incredible, incredible greatness of God's power. Stand in the midst of that with me for just a second. God's power is exceedingly beyond our ability to comprehend, explain, or even understand. And yet Paul is praying that we would be granted the ability to get a taste of it. Why? Because it would radically revolutionize our lives if we could understand just how great and powerful our God really is. Let's keep reading. Verse number 19 goes on. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So, as impressive and as incomprehensible as the macro and micro universes are to our human understanding, they are not even close to the most impressive display of God's incredible power. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave and His exaltation to the place of honor at God's right hand are the greatest demonstration of God's incredible power. A commentator by the name of John Phillips said this, he said, it took as much power to affect our redemption as it did to affect creation. To create, he said, God only had to speak. To redeem, he had to suffer. A seemingly endless universe is the demonstration of the one. An empty tomb is the evidence of the other. See, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus were decisive demonstrations of divine power. Because if there are two powers that humanity has no ability to control, but still hold us in bondage, it's death and evil. Man is mortal, meaning we cannot avoid death. Man is fallen, meaning we cannot overcome evil. But God in Christ has conquered both, meaning He can rescue us from both, and He provided that rescue in Jesus. If the death of Jesus on the cross is the supreme demonstration of the love of God, as Paul believed, then the resurrection of Jesus is the supreme demonstration 
of His power. But the resurrection is only the first act in a multi-act display of God's incredible power. Because we go on. Verse 19 again. It says, This same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the, in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So the second act, uh, so the first act is the resurrection. The second act occurred when God seated Jesus in the place of honor. Since the moment of the ascension, and at this moment, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Which, as a kid, I always thought proved that God is left-handed because, you know, Jesus was sitting on His right hand, right? That place of honor meant Jesus sitting on God's right hand, so that means God must be left-handed. Unfortunately, that's not what it's saying. God is ambidextrous, I'm sure. He prefers His left hand, but still. What, what it's saying is the seat immediately to the right of the host is the traditional place of honor reserved for the most important and the most honorable uh, guest at a given table. Now, according to ancient practice, the seat at the right hand signified a position of equality with the host. Jesus sitting at God's right hand means Jesus is equal with God and has now been given the place of highest honor and ultimate authority in all of the universe. Now, although there is some spatial imagery used here, God's right hand is not an actual place. It's a symbol of authority. And that authority is total, all-encompassing. It encompasses all that we can imagine as the rest of the passage goes on to explain verse 21. Now, He is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made Him head over all things for the benefit of the church. So, ruler, authority, power, leader, they're all titles that are believed to represent those spiritual beings uh, that are allied with Satan. These are His agents that are in the world, holding the world in subjection to Satan. But Jesus, it says, has been enthroned not just above them, but what? Far above them, and all other seats of power too. Meaning, Satan and his allies are no match for Jesus. All of the hosts of evil cannot hope to win. All they can do is put on a brave show. It also means that whatever forms of government there are, and whatever the names or titles of those who are in power might be, all are subject to Jesus. Babylonian despot or Persian satrap, Greek conqueror or Roman Caesar, Pope or Prince, Holy Roman Emperor or Muslim Sultan, British monarch, German dictator, Russian, Chinese, or American president, all must recognize there is not a being in heaven, on earth, or in hell to whom Jesus is not superior. In essence, Paul's prayer is that we would realize the greatness of the Savior that God has given to us. That being true may trigger a question for some of you. If Jesus holds the ultimate position of, of ultimate authority, then why does it seem that justice oft, or that injustice often triumphs and abuses of power go unchecked? I mean, if he could stop it, why doesn't he? I heard an account of a, of a young soldier on active duty who asked a friend, why doesn't God stop this terrible war? And his friend answered, why should he? He, he didn't start it. <laughs> valid question, valid answer. Yes, he could avert a, a war or stop it entirely, but he doesn't. Why? Because this is not the age of intervention. Think about this. An even greater mystery revolved around the cross. If God restrained himself from intervening at Calvary, when 12 legions of angels arrayed for battle, strained over the battlements of heaven with drawn swords, and God restrained Himself there. No wonder He restrains Himself from intervening today. Because this is not the day of the vengeance of our God. That day is coming when His power will be on full display. And in that season, in that day, all will clearly see that Jesus is seated far above any ruler, authority, or power, or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, 
but also in the world to come. We will see that day. Ephesians chapter 1 goes on, verse 22, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made Him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Verse 23, and the church is His body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with Himself. So I want you to recognize a truth that has been hidden in plain sight throughout this entire passage. We have discussed the immensity of the majesty of our God. We have stood in the midst of His power for a moment, and we've been awed by just how astonishing He is. But what we have likely missed is why this matters to us and how it impacts our lives. And I want to point out what I think we missed. And that's the direction of God's immeasurable power. Verse 19 says this, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in Him. And then in verse 22, he says this, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made Him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Did you see it? It's for us. It's for the benefit of those who believe. That means there is no reason for any child of God to live a defeated, discouraged life. Why? Because all of the power of the Godhead is directed for your benefit. In the book of Esther, the Old Testament book of Esther, we see an illustration of directed power, which is what this is. Under the urging of her uncle Mordecai, Queen Esther agreed to approach the king, King Xerxes, on behalf of the Jews who were facing certain and legalized extermination. But what we need to understand is that to approach a king without first being summoned by that king was to court death, even for the queen. Nevertheless, Esther walked that knife edge of uncertainty, and dressed in her royal robes, she approached and then stopped within sight of the king. And this is what it says in Esther chapter 5, verse 2. It says, When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the golden scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. So here's what was going on. All of the power of the throne of King Xerxes was suddenly turned toward Queen Esther and was turned for her benefit. He could have had her killed in that moment, but he didn't. He extended the scepter to her, and all of the power of the throne, all the power of the king, was directed for her benefit. And from that point forward, the power of that throne was exerted on her behalf and on behalf of her people. That is what happened for us who believe. That's what happens for us who believe. We have all the power of God who sits on the throne of heaven, not an earthly throne, uh, the heavenly throne, and all that power of that throne is directed toward us, for us, and for our benefit. This means that God is on your side. He stands ready to help you meet each and every obstacle, no matter its source, no matter its potency, no matter its purpose. God stands with you, and He is not going anywhere. It reveals that, that God's power is never stagnant. God's power is never out of commission. His power is always actively working on your behalf, even when, and maybe even especially when, it may not feel like it, and though you may not be able to see it, God is always working to bring about His best plan in your life. It also means that God is always fighting against the, for, or the forces of evil on your behalf. He is your guardian. Scripture says He goes before you and He follows behind you, as the Psalms say. He never sleeps on the job, so that means you can rest peacefully in Him and you can rely upon His strength to take care of you. It also means that no human strength or spiritual power of evil, not even Satan, the great deceiver himself, can deter, change, or otherwise alter God's intrinsic power. No matter how strong the attack gets, no matter how dark it seems, no matter how tired you might become, God's incredible, God's unspeakable, God's indescribable power remains sure and is unchanged. 
hear me today. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to stop and stand in the midst of the reality of what Jesus has done for you. By your own choices, you have condemned yourself to death for your sin. And with no recourse to save yourself, and with a death sentence hanging over you, Jesus himself stepped in and offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to pay the full penalty that you had earned. And by a simple decision to believe in and trust in Jesus, his sacrifice can be counted for your benefit. But it's dependent on your choice to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that's a choice that you have before you right now in this moment where you can say, I recognize I've, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I've made mistakes. I've chosen to go my own direction. I've chosen my own path regardless of what God has said. And I've kind of thumbed my nose at Him and, and I've done wrong and I see that. I recognize that. I'm, I'm suffering consequences as a result of that. I see that, but I don't want to stay that way by a simple admission that you've done wrong, and then a belief that Jesus is the only way that you can be made right. Jesus is the only way that all of your wrong can be forgiven. And then by accepting and inviting Jesus to be the Lord or the leader of your life, it's that simple choice that then invites Him into your life, and your life is radically changed from that point. I want you to understand something today. Jesus gave it all so that you could have it all. Jesus gave everything He was so that you could have everything He is. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a choice where you deny yourself, you turn away from your old life, and you choose to follow Him. And if today you would say, Pastor Nick, I want to make that choice to turn my back on my old life and turn toward following Jesus, then there's some instructions on the lower third of the screen. There's a link that's going to pop up in the chat down below. Uh, both, If you follow the instructions, they'll both lead you to the same place. But what that is, is it's a simple way for you to let us know, I'm making that choice to accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior today. Well, well why do I need to do that? Why can't I just make that choice and not tell you about it, Pastor? Well, here's why. Because Scripture says that you need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? That, that it's by both that we're saved. So it's a partnership. It's not just a, a simple decision I make in, in my own internal heart and life and I don't tell anybody about it and it doesn't really impact. No, no, no. That, that's not a confession. A confession is where you take an action upon it. And this is your action to let us know. Not only that, but understand that we have a team of people that notifies our team that when you follow those instructions, you fill out that form. It tells us, hey, this person made this decision. We've got a Bible here at the church with your name on it, or at least your, your name's ready to be on it. A brand new Bible we want to send to you for free. And all you have to do is let us know, Pastor, I'm making that decision to follow Jesus. And today I, I, want, I want you to partner with me. And that allows us to come alongside you, pray with you, and help you as you begin this walk with Jesus. So if that's a decision you're making today, let us know. Uh, by following the instructions on the screen or by uh, following the instructions by clicking the link that's in the chat right now. Before we wrap up today, I, I want to talk to every single person who's a follower of Jesus. You and I need to stand in the midst of the greatness and power of our God. That's what Paul is praying for us. We need to revel in the fact that He is for us. The first chapter of Ephesians has been one long explosion of praise from Paul, and it should cause praise to rise from within us as well. But if you find yourself today in the midst of a storm or in the midst of a struggle, it might feel impossible to raise your head and praise your God because your heart is heavy and the battle is raging and it feels like you're going to lose. I, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to hear some truth straight from God's Word. I'm going to read Psalm chapter 46 from the Passion Translation, and I want you just to listen to what it says and what it declares over you. It says, God, you are such a safe and powerful place to find refuge. You are a proven help in time of trouble, more than enough and always available whenever I need you. 
so we will never fear. Even if every structure of support were to crumble away, we will not fear, even when the earth quakes and shakes, moving mountains and casting them into the sea. For the raging roar of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. God has a constantly flowing river whose sparkling streams bring joy and delight to His people. His river flows right through the city of God Most High into His holy dwelling places. God is in the midst of His city, secure and never shaken. At daybreak, His help will be seen with the appearing of the dawn. Even the nations are in uproar with their tottering kingdoms. God simply raises His voice and the earth begins to disintegrate before Him. Here He comes, the Commander, the mighty Lord of angel armies is on our side. The God of Jacob fights for us. Everyone, look, come and see the breathtaking wonders of our God, for He brings both ruin and revival. He's the one who makes conflicts end throughout the earth, breaking and burning every weapon of war. Surrender your anxiety. Be still and realize that I am God. I am God above all the nations, and I am exalted throughout the whole earth. Here He stands. The Commander, the mighty Lord of angel armies, is on our side. The God of Jacob fights for us. That is the reality of the God that we serve. And I love how at the end of this, in the Passion Translation, the original says Selah. The Passion Translation translates it saying, pause in His presence. That's what that word means. Pause in His presence. Would you join me as we pause in the presence of God today? Lord, we stop and we recognize the incredible greatness of the God that we serve. There are no words to begin to even comprehend and describe you. Our, our best efforts, the longest speech, could never possibly begin to contain, describe, or adequately uh, help us understand just how incredible you are. God, we will spend uh, you know millions of years in heaven with you and still not even begin to plumb the depths of who you are. God, all of eternity will not be enough for us to fully comprehend and understand you, God. You are great, and the greatness of your power is extended toward us, for us, for our benefit, because you're good, because you love us, because we're your children. And God, I pray for every single person today that is struggling, that it, that is looking at their life and is recognizing, man, they are just it's in the shambles. There's a storm raging. They are struggling. They are hurting. It's hard to just even lift their head. The battle is raging around them and they're looking at it and saying, I'll never make it. But God, you are on their side. And I pray that, Lord, you would not only reveal that to them, but that, God, they would trust in the truth of what your word has declared over them, that you are on their side. You are with us. You are for us. You are working on our behalf for our benefit, God. Not because we deserve it, but because you are good. And for every single person who's making the decision to surrender their life to you, God, they then get to walk into that right relationship with Jesus. They get to experience what it's like to have the God of angel armies on their side, fighting for them, working with them, and living constantly, uh, getting to live in your presence. God, I ask that you would help your people to not just recognize this, but to walk in the confidence that it can give, God. To walk in the power and to walk in the authority of the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, God. That name, the name that is above every name, is the name that we are stamped with, we are marked with, because your Spirit lives and dwells within us. Lord, let us not take that for granted. But let us walk in confidence knowing that the God of angel armies is on our side. And I thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to leave you with a blessing today from Numbers chapter 6. It says, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you His favor and give you His peace. 
Have an incredible week, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today.